Good morning. With Neil and Tara away, I wanted to uh, step in and do the announcements this morning. Uh, so good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, for those who are joining us online or uh, on the radio, we also uh, are thankful that you're joining us today. Uh, before we begin our worship this morning, just want to uh, go over a few announcements. Uh, number one, just want to remind you, if you are visiting with us, please fill out one of the visitor forms located in the pew in front of you. I'd love to have a, a record of your attendance uh, if you've not already filled one of those out. Uh, I also want to invite everyone to be back with us this Wednesday. Um, we will meet at 7 p.m. for Bible classes. And then Thursday morning, we will meet at 10.30. Uh, if you are available, we'd love to have you join us as we are studying the book of Revelation. So uh, you're more than welcome to any uh, and all of our uh, activities. Um, just in the way of reminder, um, please uh, pick up one of the bulletins located in the foyer. Uh, that has a lot of great information. Again, so thankful that Buddy and Janine put that together for us. So please pick one of those up if you haven't uh, after services today. Uh, on the prayer list, uh, just some additional things to, to think about. Uh, Cy's grandfather, Garland Richardson, is in the ICU at Chapel Hill. Uh, he has uh, the coronavirus and, and is having kind of a difficult time with that. Uh, I know um, the family is there and, and watching over him. So please pray for the Richardson family. Also, Sai's grandmother has, uh, I don't she may have gotten through the virus now. But she had it, but now she has double uh, lung pneumonia. Uh, and so please pray for her. She is at home uh, dealing with those, but uh, she's... Uh, you know, we're just praying that she gets on the road to recovery real soon. So please pray for Miss Arlene Brown as well. Uh, Bill Bennett had surgery this week. They are continuing to work, uh, do some work on his uh, arteries and his legs. So please pray for Bill and Teresa Bennett. Also, uh, Harold Herndon, uh, an elder at Lake City, Florida. This is Adrian Blanton's uh, a really good friend. Uh, her father is an elder there, uh, and he is sick, so please pray for him. Also, um, Patrick's not here. Uh, he's been sick, uh, going under the weather here recently. And of course, we continue to remember Gary and his, uh, his, his struggles uh, as well. So please pray for the Singleton family. Um, we have um, amongst our visitors today, Michelle Thompson. She's from Jamaica. Uh, we have a letter here from her home congregation that, that they sent along with her. Uh, we'll post it on the bulletin board in the foyer for y'all to read. Uh, please welcome her to our community. Um, uh, she's um, she's uh, going to be teaching at Ben Haven um, School, so please, um, please get to know her, if you will, and, and welcome her to our community, uh, Ms. Michelle Thompson. Um, Please also remember that we are in, in the midst of an eldership search. We have forms uh, located in the foyer uh, for, uh, for names that you would like to put to the committee for consideration. Uh, the men got together, we, we have a committee. The committee's not making the decision, but they're just kind of compiling the names and doing some research uh, uh, for this. Um, there's also, uh, with the form, there's a document which lays out the process that we're undergoing in the midst of the silver search. So those are both located in the foyer. Uh, hopefully most everybody got that in the form of an email this week. I tried to send that out. If I don't have your email and uh, please uh, get that to me and I'll, I'll make sure that you're on there. Um, also uh, we had some damage to a classroom downstairs. Uh, please make sure um, Kids may be playing in there or something uh, that, that we're not damaging, you know, classroom materials or, or things for that. So uh, just a way of reminder, please uh, be attentive to that. Uh, we don't want to uh, damage that stuff. Again, so good to be here. So good to see you. Uh, as we begin our worship, would you bow with me as we go to God in prayer? 
Almighty God and Father above, we thank you so much for your great love and uh, your great demonstration of grace and mercy that you've showered down upon us uh, in sending your only Son to the cross to bear our sins. Father, we're so um, uh, grateful and sorrowful that, that that had to happen, but we're grateful that uh, for, for that great grace and we glorify you, God, uh, for, for that. Father, uh, as we gather this morning to spend this time in worship, we pray, Father, that you please be with us, that the things we say and do will be things that are acceptable to you, that bring honor and glory to your name and to, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, uh, we ask for your help as, as we are um, dealing with uh, this illness and as it is affecting our membership here and, and around the world, Father. Uh, so many are dealing with this and, and the repercussions of it. We, we pray especially for those who have been mentioned uh, by name this morning, but we also uh, know there may be those who are not mentioned. Uh, that We're also praying for, for them and, and for, um, for all those who, who are suffering. Father, we, we know you know what's best and uh, the best way to attend to, to their needs. We just pray that your, your loving hand will be upon them. Father, we are also uh, mindful of, of our eldership search. And Father, we just want to do this in the correct way, upholding your word. And, and we have such a great desire to be organized in the proper way. And we just pray, Father, that you'll bless this and, and be with our congregation that will maintain a a spirit of unity and the bond of peace. Uh, Father, that, that we'll do this with uh, open minds and ready hearts and uh, to, to receive your instruction and your guidance. Father, we pray that you'll bless any of the men's names who may be put forward as well as their families and, and bless them, Father. Father, um, again, it's such a great blessing to assemble, uh, to be a part uh, of this time of worship. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us as we do so. All this we ask in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. At this time in our service, it's time to partake of the Lord's Supper. We ask that you bow now as we give thanks for the bread. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the joys and blessings that you bestow upon us each day. At this time, Father, we are particularly thankful for the sacrifice that your Son made for us by dying on the cross. We ask that you be with us as we partake of this bread, which to Christians represents his son's, your Son's body given for us. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Continuing, now let's bow as we give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, we thank you now for our chance to participate in this symbol of your Son's blood given for us when he died for us for our sins. We ask that you be, you be with each one of us as we do so. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. I 
At this time, we're going to have a prayer for our collection. Uh, there is a box back there in the back of the building for anyone who wishes to give. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for each of the blessings that you give us, of our ability to provide for the needs for our families. At this time, Father, we give a portion of that back to you for the work of your church in this area. For we all know that all that we have is actually yours. Be with us now. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.
So let's talk about that inner struggle he has in his own uh, faithfulness. And that's a battle we all face. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11, Paul reminds Timothy, exhorts him. He says, Oh man of God, flee these things. Flee these sinful, evil things. Uh, pursue godliness. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Pursue, chase after those things. Find the good fight of faith. And that's what we're in is a fight. And he says, fight well, fight hard. Don't give in. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Life is sometimes, and quite often, more times than we'd like, a struggle. We count the ups and the downs and down sometimes seem to outnumber the ups. I don't remember where they would call that song from, but it seems like it was some cartoon. But life's ups and downs. This morning, I want to encourage and exhort all of us. Don't give in. Don't give up. And don't quit. Some of us may be on the precipice of giving up. Some of us may recently face that. To give in, to give up, to quit. Don't do it. Don't give up. Your hurdle may be in front of you closer than you understand. Let me remind you, don't give in. Don't give up and don't quit. Don't give in. In Daniel chapter 1, we read about a young man and, and three of his friends Hananiah, and Michelle, and Azariah. And this Daniel is speaking about the Babylonian captivity of the uh, Israelite people, the people of Judah. They've been taken captive by, uh, by the Babylonians, have been brought into uh, the Babylonian world. And in chapter 1 and verse 3, we get a picture into this period for Daniel and his three friends. It says, there the king calls to his chief eunuch and he says, bring some people of Israel. Use, verse 4, uh, without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. So, the king uh, summons these people. Now, this was a common practice of Babylon, and, and some other nations have done this. Babylon, of course, uh, a great conqueror of, of all kinds of nations. They've conquered Assyria. They've taken uh, captive the nations around Judah. And what they would do uh, was very skillful in subduing their enemies. They wouldn't completely annihilate the enemy. They would come in and take over. And what they would do is they would take the people out of their homeland. They would bring them into their land. And then they would begin to, uh, to program them, to reprogram the people. They would uh, bring them in. They would inundate them with Babylonian culture, Babylonian language, Babylonian ideas. And they're, they're, what they wanted to accomplish was a, basically the elimination of anything previous of their heritage. And eventually they knew that if they could maintain that indoctrination, they would eventually subdue their consciousness. They would make them Babylonians and no longer Assyrians or Jews. And you see that here in the text. As he ends verse 4 of Daniel 1, he says, he would bring he wanted these young people. Now, why did he pick out good-looking young people that were very smart? He knew they would be leaders. And he wanted to set them apart. He knew if he could get them to, to come over to the Babylonian way of life, they then could use their influence on the other people to bring them along as well. And you notice the end of that verse, verse 4, 
he says, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. They wanted to make them Chaldeans. Verse 5 tells us they were fed with the Chaldean food, with the Babylonian food. They drank of their drink, and they were educated for three years. They were educated for three years prior to coming before the king. And then they would do something else. Verse number 6, the writer of Daniel notes these four individuals. Among all the, the young people were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, most of us know Daniel, have heard that name if we've been a member of the church for any length of time. You've heard about Daniel. What about the other three? Some of you may be like, well, maybe I remember I recall something about them. I bet you know their other names better. See, what the king did is he brought them in before them, and then he gave them, verse 7, new names. Daniel he called Belteshar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. Now, I bet you know those three names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why did the king do that? He was trying to change their identity. He was trying to change who they were as people. And at the heart of all that, at the pinnacle of changing them from the inside out, was to change their name, their identity. Who they were. Now, a name is a name until you have it, and then it becomes who you are. Jimmy's Jimmy, Van's Van, Dwayne's Dwayne. That's who you are. You hear that name all your life, you become that. Your name becomes a reputation for yourself. When people hear your name in the community, they know you because your name means something. And it means something to you, most of all. He gave them new names to change who they were. I've always found it fascinating. Most of us know the new names given to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We actually, probably most of us, we admit it, we know that name more, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, more than we do their real names. But how many of us know Belteshar? Daniel didn't, that didn't stick with him, at least for us. Now, I'm talking about us living in the 21st century. Daniel, though. Now, the other three stand up as, as great examples of men of faith, as, as well as Daniel does. But I want to note something that's said of Daniel, and I'm sure it's true of his other three friends. But in verse number 8, the text tells us, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. Daniel set right in his heart from the very beginning he would not allow himself to be changed by the influences around him. He was not going to give in to the pressure. Now, Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, uh, Meshach, and Azariah, they weren't the only ones to come before the king. You notice none of the other names are mentioned. There were many other young people brought before the king of Babylon, Many others suffered under the influences, the indoctrination of the Babylonian people. And yet these four stand out as examples of resolve. Resolve to not give in. To not give in to temptation. To not give in to the pressures of the world. In 1 Corinthians 15, 30, uh, 33, Paul says, Do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. You notice in that text, he's talking about the resurrection, how some had corrupted 
the doctrine of the resurrection and were even saying Jesus had never risen from the grave. And Paul spends that whole chapter talking about that, but in the midst of that chapter, Paul says bad companions destroy good morals. Many in the Corinthian church were being heavily influenced with a false doctrine. And some were giving in. Paul says, I want you to remember this. You hang around with trash long enough, you'll begin to smell like trash. Don't make a skunk your pet. You might get sprayed. We need to be careful with ourselves and with those that we hang around. Influence is important and in how others influence us, how the world influences us. In James 1 and verse 27, the writer James there says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained or unspotted from the world. To keep oneself unstained. Not a, not a person who really likes to paint a lot, but I've had to do it over the years. I'm sure many in this room have painted walls and, and furniture and all kinds of stuff. How many of us in this room have a, have a paint shirt? How many? You can raise your hands. How many have a paint shirt? I bet several of us do. We have clothing that's designed to wear only when painting. Why do we have those clothing? Why do our children have outside clothes? Anybody have outside clothes for your children? Yeah, the old jeans with a hole in them. The, 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 start, the shirt with stains on it. You have that paint shirt, why? stain your other clothes because you know when you paint what happens. Do all you can. Now some people I, I'm amazed by it, can go and paint all day long and not have much paint at all. I, I go and paint all day and I have paint in my hair and my face, all over my clothes, on my shoes, on the floor, on the furniture. Paint gets everywhere. Sin gets everywhere. Sin will not leave us alone. Lust does not stop. The only way we are to survive is to keep ourselves unspotted by the world. We must remember bad company corrupts good morals. Be careful what you're doing, where you are, who you're with. What you're reading, what you're listening to, what you're watching with your eyes. Those things corrupt or can corrupt if they're evil. Don't give in. Don't give up. First Kings chapter 19, we read about the great prophet Elijah. You remember in First Kings chapter 18, we, we read that just, just uh, fantastic, awe-inspiring events about the, the, the two sacrifices that are set up, the, the one by the prophets of Baal and the one by Elijah. The prophets of Baal call down to their God and doesn't answer it's hilarious what Elijah says at one time. He says, you need to scream louder. Maybe your God is on vacation. Maybe he's taking a nap. Of course, he's not really there. He's not a God. He isn't real. He's a figment of man's imagination. And then Elijah calls out to his God. And you remember what happens. God uh, reacts in a big way. He sends fire down the fire consumes the sacrifice, not only does it, it consumes all the water uh, that was on the sacrifice and all the water that's in the trench around the water, and nothing's left. God has reacted. God has shown His greatness and His power. Elijah is on the mountaintop and has experienced this just great, awe-inspiring work of God. He's on the mountaintop, and a chapter later he finds himself in the cave. The same man that stood 
beside God on the top of the mountain finds himself alone in a cave one chapter later. You may remember in chapter 19 how Jezebel is angry. Chapter 1 tells us that after Ahab had told Jezebel what had happened, how he killed all the prophets of Baal, that she sent a messenger to Elijah, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. She says, I am going to kill you. Verse 3 tells us he's afraid. This great man that stood and watched God's actions on that mountaintop is afraid. And he runs away. He runs away. Verse 4 tells us he goes and he sits down under a broom tree and there he refuses to eat. He says in verse number 4 to God, he says, Is it enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my father's. That same man is now wanting to die because he's so fearful. As it goes along, we find out that God again comes to Elijah in verse number 9. And he says, Where, what are you doing, Elijah? Elijah again repeats what he said. I, I even I, I only am I'm left, and they seek my life to take it away. This is a very scared, fearful man who is struggling. Who's struggling with his faith. And then we have a powerful message by God. And, and you know, you think about verses 11 and 12. I, I think about it. And, and it's kind of an amazing event. So we find out in verse 11 that a great, strong wind comes through and it tears through the through the area and it just whipped by. It grabs Elijah's attention, but the text tells us the Lord was not in the wind. And then you have a, a great earthquake occurs and the ground begins to shake and, and, and yet the text tells us God was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, verse 12, a fire occurs but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, the sound of a low whisper comes through. That low whisper is reminding Elijah that God is still there. Verse 18 God goes on to tell Elijah, Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah felt alone. He felt unproductive. He had just, you know, participated in this great event in, in chapter 18 and, and saw God acting out of that, 400 prophets of Baal were killed because uh, of their false um, teaching and, and, and how they were corrupting the Israelite people. And Elijah, out of all that, I can imagine felt very unproductive. Wondering what good has it all been. You ever wonder that? You ever look back at the things you do for God, the things you do for the church, and wonder what good has it been? You ever been in a Bible study and have somebody not respond? It's the most empty feeling in the world. To teach someone the gospel and them not to respond? You ever done something for somebody only to not receive anything back from them? You ever wonder what's it all worth? 
What value is it? Elijah felt alone. And God reminded him in a low whisper, it's not for nothing. There's 7,000 of my people who refuse to, bow, to bend the knee, who refuse to kiss the hand of Baal or the king. God whispering to us in those small moments, reminding us, don't give up. You may not understand, you may not be able to see how God is working in a moment. Don't give up. My word will not come back to me empty. God has plans that he will accomplish and he can use each and every one of us. But we have to be patient. We have to be willing to wait. As Paul told Timothy, we must continue to fight. Even when we feel like we're losing. We must continue to fight. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't quit on God. Prophet Jonah is an interesting study. Jonah, a prophet of God, a man of God, is sent to Nineveh by God to go and to preach against the city, to call it to repentance. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Assyria is eventually going to come in and take Israel captive. Assyria is a corrupt land. They do not know nor worship the God of the Bible, the only one true God. They are a lustful people, a lustful people for the flesh, for victory, for power, for wealth. Many times have done great harm to the Israelite people. Verse 3 tells us when God says, go to that great city and preach to them, the text tells us, Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now we know what happens. He goes and, and he wants to go to Tarshish. He gets on a ship trying to run away from God, although we all know how silly that really is. He's not really running away from God. He's running away from what God has called him to do. Now for years I thought, growing up, that Jonah ran away because he was afraid. Jonah's not afraid. Jonah wants to quit because he doesn't like what God's called him to do. Jonah's running away from God and away from the mission he's called him to. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we find out exactly why he's running away. Or why he ran away in chapter 1. You remember what happens in chapter 2. He, uh, God uh, prepares a great fish. The fish comes, swallows him. And for three days and three nights, Jonah's in the belly of the fish. Jonah repents of his sin. And God has the fish to spew him up on the ground. Jonah goes on into Nineveh chapter 3. He preaches for, I believe, three days in Nineveh. And something amazing happens. In chapter 3, the people of Nineveh repent. They tear their clothes. They put, um, they put on sackcloth and ash on their face. And they bemoan the fact they have sinned against the great God. After preaching to the people, Jonah goes up on the hilltop and he looks down over the city. The text tells us he wants to see what God's going to do. God spares the people of Nineveh. And God comes to Jonah in chapter 4. 
The text tells us it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. Doesn't that seem perplexing to you? Why would he be angry? Why would he be perplexed? This people that he preached, what preacher would not love to convert a whole city to God? Wouldn't that be amazing to get on TV or on, online? You, you preach to the internet and, and thousands and thousands of people respond in faith and obey the gospel. Wouldn't that be a marvelous day? To experience what they experienced in Acts chapter 2 when 3,000 souls are baptized? I mean, what preacher wouldn't call that a success? And yet, he disobeyed God's call. And when finally God brought him back and he saw the great fruits of preaching the word of God, he's displeased and angry. He goes on to say, and I find this fascinating, At, out of his displeasure and anger, he prays to God. <laughs> I guess at least he's turning to God. He prayed to God. Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That, that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish? For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster? Therefore, now, O oh Lord, please take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. He's saying the same thing Elijah said, but just from a different attitude, isn't he? Just kill me, God. You're going to save all these people. You're going to show them mercy. Just, just kill me. Why did he run away from God? Because he didn't like what God was doing. He was upset with God because he knew what God would do had they repented. Jonah, one of the most interesting characters in all of Scripture to me. And the book of Jonah is not about a fish. It's about a man. It's about a God. And that God's mercy. Jonah wanted to quit on God. He wanted to quit on his mission. You ever felt like quitting? It breaks my heart. Every time I talk to a brother or sister or hear a brother or sister who's left the church. And I wonder and I, I'm, I'm always perplexed at how someone who knew the truth could ever walk away from it. But it happens. How could Jonah, a prophet of God, just walk away from that God? That same God showed him great mercy and he can't extend it to other people. People walk away from God, and you know, and we hear about people who walk away because somebody hurt their feelings, because they don't like the way the church does this or does that, because they don't like what the scripture says in regard to uh, roles in worship, to, uh, to music, and, uh, to singing in worship without the company of music, to to, I didn't really care for that program. I, I wish the elders or the men had made a different decision. And to walk away from God? I don't understand people sometimes. I just don't understand. But you know, that's what Satan's wanting us to do. In Luke chapter 22, Right before Jesus is to suffer, and he's there with his apostles right before he's going to go to the garden and, and, and to offer those three prayers to God, to, to pour himself out, to, to then be uh, arrested in that same garden by, by one of his former disciples leading the troop into the garden. He's going to suffer all that, and then he's going to have to go through those mock trials, and then to be humiliated and mocked all along the way. You finally have to suffer death and the cross. And all that is weighing on his heart and his mind as he's, as 
he's there with them and they're observing the Lord's Passover. And he's there with, with those men that he loves so dearly. He's there with Peter and John and James and the rest of the disciples. And at one point, Jesus turns to Simon, Peter. And I think it's interesting in the text, he doesn't call him Peter. Did you realize that Peter, that's not the name he probably went by the most? Simon Peter's the name he grew up with. Simon Peter's the name his family knew him as, his friends. Peter is the name that Jesus gives him later on. And he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. What a statement to make. Satan has demanded you individually. You notice he doesn't say that to Thaddeus, to Thomas, to Bartholomew, to Judas the lesser, or the less. It says to James or to John, he says it to Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded you to sift you like wheat. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy your life. Destroy your relationship with God, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your work life, to destroy you. He wants to sift you like wheat. Jesus says that to Peter, then he says, But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. We know what happens later on, and Jesus is going to call this to Peter's attention, that before the rooster crows uh, three times, you'll deny me three times. That very thing happened. Luke, uh, Luke records in his gospel that upon that third uh, rejection of the name of Christ, that Simon Peter looks at Jesus in the eyes. You imagine what that must have felt like. How his heart broke in that moment because he knew I failed. I am a broken man. I've done the very thing Jesus told me I would do. You ever have a sin in your life, maybe right now, that you know you're committing, that is something that you struggle with? You ever have those moments when you commit that sin and it's almost like you're looking at our Lord, knowing what you've done. The text tells us that he went away and way up, and those must have been bitter tears to weep. Simon had an opportunity, right, to either fail or succeed in that moment. Back in Luke 22, verse 32, as we bring this to a close, I love what Jesus says. This is pretty hard stuff, but what he says at the end of verse 32 is something that should bring us all a little bit of assurance in our own lives. Looking at Simon Peter, he says, when you have turned again, when you've repented, strengthen your brothers. Jesus had the confidence in Peter that Despite what he's struggling with, despite what Satan is trying to do to him, you will overcome. I believe in you. You can do this. Just don't quit. Just don't quit. When you turn again, when you come back to me, strengthen the brothers. Even knowing what Peter was going to do, Jesus still believed in him. Strengthen your brothers. God believes in you. God will never give up on you. 
God won't ever give up on you. No matter what happens, no matter where you find yourself, no matter how great your sin may be, God will not stop loving you. God will not stop trying to reach out to you. The only one who can quit is you. Don't you quit on God. Because He'll never quit on you. Where are you at with your relationship to God? Are you as committed to you or to your own salvation as God is committed to it? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That all should come to repentance leading to salvation. This morning, are you prepared and ready to do what God has called you to do? If you've walked away from God, are you ready this morning to turn back? To repent of your sins? And if in a public way, if your child of God has fallen away and, and you need to come make that confession publicly, we're here to help you with that. We'd love to pray with you. We offer the same forgiveness that God offers, which means we forgive and we forget and we move on. If you've never obeyed the gospel, why do you continue to wait? Why do you continue to put it off? If you need to obey the gospel, if you're ready to repent of your sins, to confess Jesus as Lord, and to be obedient in baptism, we're ready to help you. If you just need to study more about it, you need to understand it better, what God's calling you to do, we'd love to sit down and talk with you, to open the scriptures, to show you, to, to study with you about what God is calling you to do. We'd love to help you. If in any way we can help, please come as together we stand and as we sing.